Today I'll be reading from the uh, New Living Translation. It's up on the screen as well as also in your bulletin. Verse 16 says this, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Elijah was, a hum- was as human as we are. And yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Then when he prayed again, the sky, uh, the sky sent down rain and, and the earth began to yield its crops. As we continue along on this journey of looking at prayer, the topic of prayer, um, there's one fundamental question that I think is always on the back of our minds. There's a question that we always ask, whether out loud or sometimes just something that we hold inside. And that question actually is, can be a biggest, one of the biggest hindrances to even praying, to actually praying. And the question is this, does our prayer really make a difference? Does our prayer really make a difference? You know, this is election, election season, right? And uh, think about elections is that, number one, I mean, the candidates have gotten significantly, each cycle, the candidates are less and less desirable, at least to me. Um, and I began to just wonder, does my one vote among millions does it really matter? I lived in Oregon. I lived in California. I'm like, does my one vote really matter when there are millions of people voting? So I stopped voting. I know. <laughs> I was like, oh, but I think last presidential election, I, I voted. And after that, I said, man, my vote didn't even matter. It was a landslide for the, uh, you know, uh, for the other side. And so, you know, other people and I, we, we have this discussion. And one of the things that people who, uh, who want you to vote, one of the things they say is, if everybody thought their vote didn't count and they didn't vote, you guys wouldn't be able to make an impact. Now, that's kind of the argument that, that they use, right? The same thing with prayer. We're like, does my prayer really matter? Does my prayer really make a difference? Because we, we, one of the passages we, passages we looked at in Matthew chapter 6, verse 8, it, it tells us before we even pray, God knows what we need. If that's the case, then why do we pray? Does our prayers really change anything? And that's kind of the fundamental question that we have. Doesn't God accomplish what he wants? regardless of our prayers. Doesn't he accomplish them when he wants and how he wants? And if so, why should we pray? These are the questions that are out there. It might not be a question that you ask every day, but it's definitely out there. Somebody at some point in history has asked those questions. We've looked at why we need to pray. We've looked at the model of prayer that Jesus taught us. And we've looked at reasons or some of the challenges or roadblocks to praying. Today, I want to tackle this question. Does our prayer make a difference? When we read the passage in James chapter 5, James is actually quoting an event that takes place in 1 Kings 17 and 18. And it's the story of Elijah. And one of the things that James says here is that, that Elijah, when he prayed, rain stopped. When he prayed again, rain fell again. Okay, there was a period of about three and a half years, I think, where there was a, a large famine, right? basically a drought, because no rain fell on the land. But in verse 16, he says, the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and pr- produces wonderful results. When we see these kind of words, we have to think, perhaps there is some value in prayer. Perhaps there is something about prayer that, that when we engage in prayer, that it produces results. 
contrary perhaps to what you and I might think. So based upon this passage, I think there's three things I want us to uh, understand about prayer, or perhaps the power of prayer. First thing is this, there is power, the power of a single prayer. Power of a single prayer. Have you ever wondered uh, what your life would be like if a certain event in your life didn't take place? Okay. I look back and I wonder, what, what would I be like? What would my life be like if my, parent, my family never immigrated to America? For my parents, uh, life in Korea would have been extremely difficult. They were uneducated. They did not have the luxury of studying. They wanted to, but the situation in their family caused them not to be able to. In their generation, if you didn't, yeah, I guess you had to take some kind of fees to the schools. You had to pay some kind of a fee. I don't know if that's still true in Korea nowadays, but they would go home, and when they didn't bring it, the teachers would send them home. Go home. Come back when you have the fees. So my mom and dad, you know, um, they just did not get much education. So without that edu- education, their path would have been very limited in what types of jobs that they could do, thus providing for us. So when the opportunity came for them or was presented to them to move to America, for their children's sake, just like every other immigrant family, they packed up their bags and they moved to America. What would my life be like if I grew up in Korea? Would I speak English? Probably not. You know, that's, that's an interesting thought. Would I be able to think the way that I think, the way that I live, everything that I, I have today, I, I don't think that would have been the case. Whatever that one event that you and I can think about, both positively as well as negatively, if that certain event didn't take place in our life, how would our lives be different? There's a quote that I want us to read. It's by a man by the name of E.M. Bounds. He says this about prayer. God shapes the world by prayer. The more praying there is in the world, the better the world will be. The mightier the forces against evil. The prayers of God's saints are the capital stock of heaven by which God carries on his great work upon earth. The first time I read this quote, honestly, I didn't know how to process it. It's not that I didn't agree with what he says, but I've never thought about prayer in this way. I've never thought about prayer in a way that would be able to change the world. I know that sounds weird, but I grew up in the church. We prayed a lot, but, you know, honestly, the passage is about, you know, if you have a, if you have, if you pray with faith, basically, you can move mountains. It was really hard to believe that. Because that's not the t- level of faith that you and I normally have. But when I read this, um, it, it was really difficult for me. Because I never really thought about prayer in this way. When we look at this quote, and let's, when we begin to unpack a little bit what, what he is saying, the first part, God shapes the world by prayer. So once again, the question this morning is, does our prayer make a difference? God shapes the world by prayer. Whose prayers is he talking about? It's our prayers, your prayers and mine. Not the holy, super spiritual, the religious leaders' prayers, but your prayers and my prayers. God shapes the world through our prayers. Our prayers shape the world. I don't know how that sounds to you. To think that when you pray that God would move, that that is incredible. God shapes the world by prayer. He says this, the more praying there is in the world, the better the world will be. There are things that's happening all around us. You know, today, uh, there's going to be a sex education seminar uh, for our parents of our church. And as I was preparing for that, 
things happened, even as recently as Friday in America, that, that are just, makes me just shake my head. Because there are things going on all around us. I, I don't know, it's like all of a sudden, everything just seems to be going downhill. And that's the sense that I get. You know, people are less happy. Uh, church attendance is dropping. Um, it seems like the, the trouble in this world, hardships, things of that nature are increasing. And as I was thinking about this, I wondered, could it be because we are not praying? Was, is there a direct correlation between all of these things that are happening and the amount of prayer that are lift, being lifted up? Is there a cause and effect? I believe there is to a certain degree. The more praying there is, the better the world will be. What is it about prayer that would lead someone to state, make such a statement, to have such a belief? What happens when we pray that someone could make this statement? That's a question that we're going to take over the next several weeks to un unpack as well. What happens when we pray that someone could make this kind of statement? That the more praying there is in the world, the better the world will be. Prayer is the means by which God carries on his work upon the earth. So that last part, the sovereign God, the sovereign God of the universe, who can accomplish anything he chooses whenever he wants to, carries on his work on earth through our prayers. This got me thinking a little bit more. We know why we pray. We know that we should pray. But we don't sometimes understand the magnitude of our prayers. We don't pray with the fervency. We don't pray, pray with the, the, the kind of faith that Scripture tells us to pray with. Power of a single prayer. Do you know that you and I are here because somebody prayed for us at some point in, in the history, in some point in the past. There are intricate connections. One of the things that I, uh, I had the pleasure to do many years later, uh, in college, my, uh, what year was that? My sophomore year in college, I began to, you know, just like typical, typical of many college students, when I left home, when I left comforts of my family, I didn't have that voice that said, it's Sunday, get up and go to church. Okay? And so there were a few days when I didn't go to church. And honestly, it felt really good not to be able to do things that, quote, unquote, my parents were forcing me to do in some way. That's kind of how we thought, right? And so as I started, you know, experiencing all of these different things, there was a guy in, uh, in the church who really simply, all he did was invite me to his house because some guys got together for Bible study. And that, that began a journey for me to kind of uh, rediscover and, uh, and kind of explore faith as my own, apart from my family, apart from uh, my parents. And as we, as we experienced that, and as I, God began to use that occasion to bring change and restore me, it restored the relationship. I think when I was a senior, I was talking with another guy. And uh, he, I was telling him how you know, a guy named Mark was so pivotal in, in drawing me back into a uh, walking you know, relationship with Jesus. And he says, oh, yeah, you know, I actually discipled Mark. He's like, oh, that's crazy. You know, and, you know, um, and he's like, you know, and I met somebody recently who said that you disciple them. And so right in that conversation, we were able to track a disciple, a disciple to a disciple who also discipled me and who I also discipled the other person. And that line and that lineage continues even today. There's power in prayer, but there's a power of a single prayer. That sometimes, somewhere in the past, somebody said, 
Oh, Lord, have mercy on John. He's a troublemaker at church. Breaks windows. He's always doing, causing trouble. I guess when I was little uh, in Korea, my mom and dad used to tell me that during middle of service, I would get up and I would run up to the podium when the pastor is speaking. I would just sit, sit, just run around. I guess I was getting comfortable for the stage for my future profession or something. I, I don't know, but I'm like, man, if, if that happened today, if somebody, if a little kid ran in you right now, all of you guys would be like, oh, what is... But I guess in that time, they were just cool with it. And look at me, I turned out to be a pastor. <laughs> but, you know, when people look at me, you know, they're like, man, John needs help. He needs prayer. I think I'm going to pray for John. I believe that happened in the past. And I believe that the prayer that was offered has an effect on why I am standing before you this morning. We are here because there are people who pray for us. And I know, I know very, I, I, I am very confident that there are people who are praying for me and my family right now. Our friends, our, our people that, um, not just here in Portland, but also those who are in California. I am confident that they are also praying for our ministry and praying for Young Nak which is you guys. You and I are where we are because somebody prayed for us. There is power in us in prayer. There's a guy named Dutch Sheets who has a book called Intercessory Prayer. That's what it's titled. And in that book, he says this. Our prayers can bring revival. They can bring healing. We can change a nation. Strongholds can come down when and because we pray. There's power in prayer. Your prayer can change the course of someone's life. Just think about that for a second. Your prayers can change the course of a person's life because there is power in prayer. When we pray, God responds. When we pray, God moves. Second point this morning is God wants our involvement. Not only is, is there power in prayer, but God wants our involvement. When you understand that God desires for us to pray and that our prayers make a difference, wouldn't you pray more? Dutch Sheets, he continues with this quote. If we believe that our prayers are merely religious discipline, then we will not be likely to persevere when we don't see the answers that we expected. But if we can see in the word that by God's plan, our prayers do affect changes in the de destinies of others and in the extension of God's kingdom, then we are more likely to take the privilege seriously and devote ourselves to consistent and persistent prayer. If prayer is just this exercise that you and I do, if prayer is something that we just do out of duty, when we don't receive the answer, we will stop praying. But if you begin to see prayer as a source of God moving and God operating in this world. That it can affect change in other people. That it can affect destinies. It can affect change nations. Then we take it as a privilege to pray, not a duty. That if it's a privilege to pray, you will pray more. God wants our involvement. In this, in this passage in James 5, he, like I said, he summarizes what ha what's happening in 1 Kings chapter 17 and 18. Elijah was a human as we are. Yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Then the, when the, he prayed again, the sky sent down rain and the earth began to yield crops. If we look at this passage in 1 Kings 17, it says this. Now Elijah was a prophet from the settlers in Gilead. I serve the Lord, the God of Israel, Elijah said to Ahab. As surely as the Lord lives, 1 Kings 17, 1, no rain or dew will fall during the next few years unless I command it. That's what he says to the king. 
And in chapter 18, verse 4, he says this. Or chapter 18, verse 41. Then Elijah said to Ahab, Now go eat and drink, because a heavy rain is coming. That is a period of about three and a half years. Could God have made the rain stop? And could God have sent the rain again without involvement from Elijah? That's the question we have to ask. Could, is God capable of that? And the answer is, of course. But then why does God use Elijah for this purpose? Because God wants our involvement. Think about this for a second. God could have simply withheld the rain from the land. As long as he wants. And he can open the heavens again. But why use Elijah? What's the significance of that? God chooses to work through our prayers. This is an incredible thought. Does our prayer make a difference? Absolutely. God chooses to work through our prayers. God wants our involvement. Once again, I I don't know how that makes you feel. Hopefully that's, that's spurring you on inside to really begin to develop a prayer life. Because if you're dissatisfied with, with what's going on in this world, could it be because you have not prayed for our nation? Honestly, when's the last time we really pray for our nation? When's the last time you really pray for our church? When's the last time you really prayed for things that are outside of your own sphere, your circle, your comfort zone. God wants our involvement. Third, God's plans are changed through prayer. Now, this is a very cautious statement. And we're going to actually look at a passage that is very controversial. Turn to Exodus chapter 32. One of the questions that uh, people have asked, uh, not just to me, but to, to Christians and Christian leaders in general is, does God change his mind? Does God change his mind? And this is one of the passages that they always point to, um, to kind of defend their view of God uh, and that challenge the deity of, deity of God. And this is one of those passages because when we read this, when we read what's going on in Exodus 32, um, God does change his mind. He sets out to do something, but he changes his mind. He wants to bring judgment, but he withholds judgment. And so people look at this and say, how, how can God change his mind? So this is kind of a, one of those passages that people look at. But we're looking at it in, in a different context today. Basically, what's going on in Exodus chapter 32 is um, the story of the golden calf, right? This is what's going on here. The background here is that uh, Moses is up in the mountain. He's praying to God, and he's not coming down. So the Israelites are saying, hey, Aaron, we don't know what happened to Moses. We haven't seen him for a while. Make us a God. That's kind of what they request. So that we have something. So Aaron says, okay, bring me all your gold. They bring the gold, they melt it down, and they make it into a form of a, a cow, basically. A calf. Make a statue. And as Moses is talking with God, God says, oh, these people. Look at verse 9. I have seen how stubborn and rebellious these people are. Now leave me alone so my fierce anger can blaze against them, and I will destroy them. Then I will make you, Moses, into a great nation. I will make you into a great nation. God is upset. The religious, the spirituality of the people 
of the Israelites as they came and left, as they you know, wandered in the wilderness, it, it was so shallow. They complained, they grumbled about all kinds of stuff. And God has said, you know what, I've seen these people. And even now, look what they're doing. I will destroy them, wipe them out. That's his plan. Verse 11 and 12, Moses begins to interact with God and says, so basically he says, what would people think? What would people say about you? Here you are, here's this God of the Hebrews, brings them out into the wilderness only to slaughter them. And Moses begins to intercede on behalf of the Israelites. In verse 14, so the Lord changed his mind about the terrible disaster he had threatened to bring on his people. The Lord changed his mind. Moses' prayer affected God's plans. Moses talked with God, and it affected change. God was sent to destroy, but Moses, he talked with God. What we, what, how do we define prayer? Prayer is what? Talking with God, communicating with God. So Moses didn't pray like perhaps like you and I did or you and I do. He was already talking with God, which is, I mean, a form of prayer. Moses' prayer changed God's plan. That's the power of prayer. God's plans are changed through our prayers. If Moses didn't pray, Israel would have been destroyed. Or the Israelites would have been destroyed. And God would have started over with Moses. Prayer really makes a difference. Does our prayers make a difference? That was the question that we started with. And we see through just a few examples not just the power of prayer, but the power of a single prayer. We see how God wants our involvement. We see that through our prayers, we bring about change, even in God's plans. God accomplishes His will through our prayers. Prayer is not just some exercise that we do. It really can change a person's life it literally can change the world. God wants us to pray because he wants to work through our prayers. I don't know about you, but this spurs me to devote myself more time to prayer. I think I've shared with you before, but Pastor, Pastor Ron Mel was a senior pastor at Beaverton Four Square Church. Uh, he, he passed away uh, about 10 years ago already. But when I met him years, years before, a couple years before he passed away, one of the things that he shared with me is, John, if I could do it all over again, I would pray more. At the time, his church was, what, 10, 11,000 members. And he's like, I would pr- if I could start all over again, I would pray more. That, that has left a huge imprint and impact upon my life. I know I don't pray as much as I used to, I know I don't pray as much as I need to. When I used to commute to from, um, from Chino Hills in California, Chino Hills is about 45 miles from Koreatown. The school that I worked at was in Koreatown. 45 miles each way. I did 90 miles a day. I spent an hour and a half to two hours going each direction, depending on traffic. Sometimes... Over two hours just to get into the office or to the school because there was an accident or something like that. When you're driving, what can you do? So I used to listen to worship. I used to pray a lot. But now my commute is 10 minutes. How much prayer can you get done in 10 minutes? Maybe I need to move to Eugene. I just don't spend as much time in prayer because my, my time that I used to have 
When you're driving, really, you can't do much, right? But except for concentrate and drive. My schedule, the time that I used to use for that, it's, it's been filled with other things. Some of it is not as productive. I don't pray as much as I, do, I used to. We need to start praying more. We need to pray for our nation, our leaders, our families, our friends. It also includes our church, our church leadership. We need to pray for the relationships. Look, our church has hundreds of people. There's got to be a few people that don't like each other. It's possible. It's very possible. What are we doing as a church, as members of this family? What are we doing? Are we praying for them? Or are we just saying, you know what? It's not my thing. We have to pray for our, our co-workers, our bosses, our companies. All I'm saying is we need to pray more. We pray because your prayers can affect change. We pray because when you, when you pray, you have no idea how that will bring about change down the road. Because you and I are here today because somebody prayed for us. And there are people that you are praying for. Someday, they will not realize, but someday, the prayers that you are praying, God will hear and God will honor that. Our prayers make a difference. We're doing a series on prayer because I believe it's its value is there and its importance. But more than anything, we pray because we can bring change. And Lord knows we need to bring change to this nation, to our cities, our schools, our families. My desire at the beginning of the series was that through the series, that you will develop a prayerful life. Over the next couple of weeks, we'll look at this idea or the concept of intercession, intercessory prayer, and what that's all about. Because you're already doing it and you don't realize it. But this morning, as we tackle this question, instead of a question, let me make it as a statement. Our prayers make a difference. Amen.